Welcome to our series of interviews marking the 200th birth anniversary of Gregor, Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics as we know it today. I'm Astha Vatsai, a PhD student in Dr. Vinod Skarya's lab. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Jay Shet, who from his long list of accomplishments is the chairman and co-founder of the Institute of Human Genetics and chairman, and uh, chairman at Foundation for Research in Genetics and Endocrinology, to name a few. He's a pioneer in the field of lysosomal storage disorder research, especially within the much needed context of Indian communities and subpopulations. Uh, welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, sir, you've made uh, several important contributions uh, to varied areas of science. Uh, could you briefly discuss what your current uh, research interests or the research interests of your know, institutions are at the moment? If I start from the beginning, I'm basically, I started my career as a basic as endocrinology. So with thyroid and reproductive endocrinology. Right. If you look at, I started my journey in 1986 after completing my PhD. Right. And uh, my first training abroad was in Monash University in IVF in 1989. With, uh, and at that time, I know, remember that there was a, the, the Monash, the, uh, Melbourne Herald took an interview and then they gave in the next day the newspaper they gave the Fertile India's IVF program. This I'm talking for 89. Nice. At the time, my more interest was in the property and technology because I was a student in Institute for Research in Reproduction. I did my study there. And then I, that we were the first, I was the first one to offer the prenatal screening program in India you know, for the prevention of the Down syndrome. In 1993, at that time, it was not uh, very available in the country. So I went to the Portland, Maine, in the uh, Portland, Maine, where the Foundation for Blood Research, where they first screened this, the old samples of the DS mothers, down, the mother who delivered Down syndrome child, and they identified that this alpha fetoprotein is young particular estriol and SCG used as a, a screening markers with around 70 to 75 percent sensitivity specificity. And George Knight was my mentor at the time. This was in 1993. And again, in the so uh, I started my journey with endocrinology, but always had the link with the genetics. So this was, I think, I was just putting my seeds there in the early in 1980. First, my first paper of publication in genetics, I say that it was on uh, umphalocyte. Prenatal diagnosis of umphalocele by um, amniotic fluid alpha fetoprotein. And my first publication in 1980, no kits were available. No other markers were there. No sonography machine was there. So I, I know, remember the Dr. H. I. Jal, how foresighted those mentors. Dr. H. I. Jal, at that time, he was a uh, superintendent in Harkishan Hospital in Mumbai. He brought a Lancet, uh, he used to read a lot of uh, magazines, and so he gave me one Lancet uh, magazine, and uh, the DJ had brought, he first published that alpha protein beyond needle tube defect, at uh, the needle tube defect diagnosis. He said, just why don't you establish this technology? It was a rocket electrophoresis. So you can understand by rocket immuno electrophoresis, I, I made the diagnosis of the infelocyte prenatally. And then uh, I did the uh, uh, published a paper. It was in the Indian Journal of Pathology and Microbiology. So that was like, though it is an endocrine work, but I think it was, I was soaking the seeds of the uh, genetics. So at, since 1980, I've been in the genetics. Work. And then in 1993, after taking my training, I got the fellowship in Erasmus University. And uh, again, in the training in the immunological, the uh, endocrine, endocrine part. I took the training there, and then, you know, 1995, 90, they, we just started the genetic center. We thought because my wife, Dr. Freni, she completed her PhD, and was, she was a CSR fellow, CSR fellow for eight years. And she completed her study and then looking for the job. I said, why would you do a job? Let's just do some, at least do some services. So started with the genetic services, let's promote them. So one of the dermatologists from my hometown, he brought some whole bus of the family, with 30 people having the no hair, baldness, increased keratinization in the palm and soul. He said, hey, but this is a whole family, they really have a find a problem. They don't get the match. When they have to marry, they have to marry within the community. So there is definitely some genetic component is there. So one of our colleagues in Geneva, 
Dr. Radha Krishna, he was working there with Stelianos, Antonakis, you must have heard the name of Antonakis. So we wrote to him, this is the family and we are interested to do the work. He said, we send all the pedigree, everything. He found it definitely because at that time, this NGS was not available, only Sanger was there. And you know, the, you all have to work the linkage, uh, linkage study. So, so we took all the DNA samples, we carried with us, went to DNA, the Geneva personally, and then we did find out that this is a linkage to chromosome 13Q and identified this as a Clownston syndrome. And that was my first paper in genetics in 1996 in American Journal of Medical Genetics, that the large Indian family with the Clownston syndrome residing in the uh, village. And this was only thing we lost the credit by one month because Canada has published a paper before that and we were delayed because we needed some clinical information. So then we were the second one to report this clown syndrome linkage to the 32. So that is my journey with the genetics one, with the genetic study. And then we moved on with Dr. Ambani. I don't know whether you heard the name of Dr. Ambani. In those days, in IRR, was, had a, one good genetic center. So Dr. Ambani, Lalit Ambani, was doing the metabolic work there. So he was also doing some lysosomal disease. So he told Jais, why don't you do the at least isodium and enzymes? This is really because we are really missing and there were some anecdotal papers were there, but not fit full scale at what we do now. Right, so okay, let me look at it. So that's how my journey started with the lysodium respiratory disorders. And I went to the Gaia Hospital. If, if you heard the name of Fansom, in Gaia Hospital, Fansom, he wrote a book on the lysodium disorders. I went to him. I studied everything. I tried to understand what exactly it is. And then we published the first paper in 2004, where I think we were not knowing what is life cycle storage disorders. So I think it came in Indian pediatrics also in a little note that the storage disorder, what we think that India doesn't have, but no, we have. And we say that the lipid storage disorders followed by the MPS disorders are, are there in India. And uh, again, what we say that is a, the kind of genetic, uh, genetic disorder. Means if you look at the child, with dysmorphology, skeletal dysplasia, neurodegradation, seizures, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, 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 then we can say that the difficulty in walking or ataxia. So such kind, so such, such kind of the children when you see them, then are almost about forty percent of such children high risk index group. I would say that they have forty percent chances. They have underlying cause of lysosomal respiratory disorder, but this was a very small, 130 children study in 2004. Then we continued our journey and we modified the essay because those essay also were not very well standardized. So then we standardized more so more many of the essays. And again in 2013 we published a paper in JMD, and then we said yes, the around 35 to 40 percent of children with skeletal dysplasia, with neurodegradation, with cherry response, with seizures with uh, uh, difficulties in the, the learning disabilities, they have underlying cause of storage disorders. So this is how our journey started in LSDs. And I thank Dr. Katuch, I say my duty, for sitting in a private center in 2008, he gave me the first grant that to, to study the life of storage disorders. And that has made my journey, con until it, I have been getting some form of the grant from ICMR, all every, throughout the, this right from 2008 to 2022 now. So I've been associated with ICMR Institute and uh, doing my, uh, continuing my journey. I, I think it's, it's a learning process still. I would say that now we have come out with some new concept. The lysosomes are beyond the storage disorders. They are not only involved with the storage disorders. There may be so many reasons that you process in the body. So I think that's a new thought, we will stop later on. So this is how my the current, my focus is on, at least my personal focus is on the lysosomal storage disorders, understanding the developing the new technology, the affordable tech, not NGS based. Is NGS based affordable, right? Which can identify not only the SNP but CNV together. So you don't have to look at the MLPA. Like for many of the storage disorders, you do find the MLPA, uh, the, the deletions or duplications which you will not be able to identify by the Sanger or by the NGS. But mm -hmm. we are developing the MIP technology, 
that MIP technology will be able to identify the SNP and CNV together. So we are developing only for the 23 common. What we identify the most common 23 lysosomal disorders. So then we can offer the people at an affordable price. So it is a part of the uh, Department of Biotechnology DPT study and also part of the GSPTM study also. So we have been developing it. It is in the process. Almost I think we have standardized, we are offering also. We found that it's really giving a very good comparable and more, it identified the deletions also. So we have taken some cases where we do know the deletions, some of the cases where we know the duplications, and then we, uh, that, that is what our focus is on. Great. Well, quite a remarkable journey, sir. Uh, sir, uh, what would you say, uh, Mendel's work, how would you say it has impacted your journey so far? Or how it has affected your work in how many different ways? I would say that, see, like, first, I gave example first, like Mendelian, the law, the, the Clownston syndrome. It mm -hmm. first came to my mind, looking at the family, there definitely some inheritance is there. Mm -hmm. And we found that it is an autosomal dominant condition there. Yeah. So that is how the, uh, and now in the daily, if you look at the, look at the story disorders, bisexual story disorders, except the February disease and the uh, Hunter disease, which are the X-linked, all are the, the, the autosomal recessive disease. So we understand now the disease process very well with the, using the Mendelian law. And uh, not only that, like the rare diseases, even the common the genetic disease in the country also, which uh, has impacted like for the sickle cell disease, hemoglobinopathy, thalassemia, hemophilia, look for the SME, look for the DMT. I think our center was the first one to publish even a paper on spinomuscular atrophy, I think way back in some 2010 or 2011, that the, the SMA, SMN1, SMN2, the exon uh, 7, exon 8 lesions, how common it is in those children, and what are the cl main clinical criteria once to suspect the SMA. So that was the paper again in, on SMA. I think perhaps that is the only paper available from the country at those times. Uh, now there are many papers out there. So I think millennial uh, theory, millennial laws are in our everyday practice of the genetics. So the first we, we apply that, okay, the family comes, Look at first the pedigree chart. Try to understand what is the disease penetrance in there. How it is actually it is sporadic, is is a dominant conditions. So that really helps us. So that's why what when we take the children, the students here. So uh, I tell them first thing we train them first. You first learn to make a pedigree, and first try to understand the dysmorphology, common common words of dysmorphology. So when you are working in the genetics. You are not working only in the lab, but you have to have sometimes exposed to the patients also. Some family comes and it's, it's to click to your mind that what kind of the inheritance the family is carrying. Then only you can decide what kind of investigators. Now you know that everyone just talks of the NGA, but don't understand, do the exome study. I still have a lot of difference of opinion for that. No, we should not do that. We should use the needle only when we don't require a gun all the time. So try to use the minimum investigations and the maximum output, but that is only possible when we understand the correct, the inheritance patterns, understanding the proper Mendelian law. Absolutely, sir. Uh, sir, definitely like your work showcases for researchers, it is absolutely important to uh, study about genetics, but do you think it's also important for the common man or people who are not uh, strictly associated with sciences in general to study about uh, genetics and Mendel's law in general? Well, why not? Why not? It's very important. I have been, that's why, you know, many of these complex genetic diseases, I write in my local uh, Gujarati magazine, Akhandana. Okay. It's a very popular here in Gujarat. In perhaps our PM or so, uh, Prime Minister Modi also reads like Akhandana. So I translate. Like I write, it is like, I always say that DNA is like a horoscope. You are born with it. You are born with horoscope, you are born with it. So DNA, you are born with it. Now only try to understand. So it's not that all DNA, what you find the abnormality is always a hard. Some, some the nature has given a protection, like for sickle cell. You know, those living in the forest area or jungle there because nature wanted to give a protection to them. So they gave a sickle cell and then they're protected by the malaria. Same way you know that the, the similar study we did, I remember again in 1999, the uh, James Gillian Arkansas University in uh, USA. Similar publication, 
that the mother who has given a birth to down syndrome child they did the study of mthfr gene methanate by mthfr gene they found that c6770 so c to t polymorphism those mothers are at higher risk for the down syndrome so i read the paper and i did the repeat i repeat i did the thyroid study homocysteine and methionine and cystathione and i did the same study i found that no this is not the correct one what c publicity may be context in the us context is fine but indian context i think i was the first one to say in this was in again in the came in indian pediatrics as a commentary and editorial that i only 30 patients i did the subject 30 mothers with down syndrome i did the study and the 30 controls who had a normal child i found the ct early the ct polymorphism in mthfr was common in both the group mother who gave a birth to the down syndrome child and mother who does have not given the, the, the birth to the down, normal child this that means that is not the contributory factor but that is the paper where i said that 40% of the the mother in india they have bitual deficiency so beyond folate the bitual deficiency is common and i don't remember exactly the year 2003 or 2004 i just paper published one isolated case to report in the journal of obstetrics and gynecology of india the recurrent deletive defects beyond folate deficiency because till then all we were thinking that only folate deficiency give a supplement to the folate when the mother having a neurological defect child give a folate but then but the first paper that with mtta first study and then the second study case report i said that no you must give the bitual and folate together in india so this is very important for indian context till then we were only giving the folate only and then that has given a birth to the dbt multi uh, multi centric study i was a part also in our center FCRF Chennai, Nizam Institute Hyderabad, and then KM Pune. We four centers were involved. We study it was the largest studies of neural tube defects uh, the child. So mother, six hundred mothers. We enrolled from orthopedic centers, and we identified the, what is the, what is the genetic factors, what are the nutritional factors involved. So like nutritional factor, we found that as I said in the small study, I found a bitual deficiency. Again, we made the conclusion yes, the those who are TT polymorphism. They are higher risk for neural tube defect, but same time the B12 B12 is a common contributor everywhere. So whether it is non-vegetarian or vegetarian, the B12 deficiency is common. So that is why till the now we say that we have to give a B12 or folate both. As you know that the B12 or folate are very important for DNA synthesis and then the DNA expression also in chromosome segregation. So this was this is how the though it is a complex research. I translate it in a very very common manner. Okay. We just take the folate bit well. That's going to benefit to you. Yes, sir. So clearly, your work has a direct impact on patients. It's a clearly very translational work. So, so I mean, how? We did one similar similar thing. We did is one work on uh, vitamin D. Again, that was the first work in 2015 in diabetes research published. We said the vitamin D is 90% of Indian population. Has a vitamin E deficiency. I was studying some diabetic patients here. Some project was there on the type two diabetes. Try to understand why the Gujarati people are more prone to diabetes. We all know that biotin because they have high high triglyceride. Their lifestyle. We all don't take the healthy food. Many people. So that if you look at the in Gujarat, if you look at the lipid profile, almost sixty percent people will have a high triglyceride level because of the dietary and lifestyle habit. And so we did this, some uh, the genetic study was there, and then also I did identify the let me do the vitamin D and vitamin B12. Uh, for the 90% of those 600 type 2 diabetic patients, they have a vitamin D deficiency. At the same time, control group also had the same deficiency. So again, because you know those days there was a there was a lot of paper coming up that in type 2 diabetes we give vitamin D. It perhaps it is the cause of the vitamin type 2 diabetes. But then again I say that no. It is commonly seen, so you cannot say that is a. It is one of the contributor. It can be said. You can't say because of vitamin D deficiency you have a diabetes. Yes, you can have a better life if your vitamin D is normal. So that was uh, my paper. Uh, that I think we were the first one, and I sent that copies to ICMR also and then the PMO also. I think vitamin D is commonly commonly seen in India. At that time, I think I got a reply from the ICMR that this study is done only in urban population, not in rural. And you know the situation in COVID situation. We know that. Right. What happened in COVID? Right. Everyone was giving the vitamin D because we found the vitamin D deficiency is commonly seen across the country, whether it is urban or whether it is a rural area. 
So that is, I think, I try to do the complex research in simplified way into common men uh, to help. That's the need of the also I, 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 I translated this in Gujarati, but the common men, and then published in the Gujarati magazine. So the people are left, because I always believe that uh, that the, whatever do we do the research has to have some translation. Though it is a fundamental, has to have some translation approach. So because we are using the taxpayers' money. Absolutely. So when we express money, it is our duty that we, if we, I always tell the granting, you give me five rupees worth, I will deliver you 50 rupees worth to you. I will give more, I will, I will give more the, uh, the back to you. Uh, uh, so uh, if you give me a proper funding, uh, sometimes I just tell them a little bit outspoken. So I tell them sometimes. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, your, your work clearly has a lot of direct impact on uh, the health of people. Uh, but sir, how can the knowledge of genetics uh, be used to shape public policy in a way such that your work can reach more and more people or, or in any other way? How, how can the knowledge of genetics help bring about essential changes very in public health very, policy? Very important, very important. I have been talking to my media friends also in Doodles and so even on Doodarshan also in Gujarati, I do give many programs. I think in COVID time, almost every one week I used to give a program. Every one week to common men, what is to be done. So I make a lot of engagement. Not, it's like you stay in Delhi, people understand the Hindi language. So what the complex is that you do, try to simplify and reach out to people in writing in some magazines organize some seminars for the common men, reach on the, the TV media, print the media. So what I do perhaps, I think it's good that I, uh, people know because being a pioneer in the field of endocrine and genetics, both in Gujarat, so almost every media, print media, or the, the, the Doodarshan or the government, they know me very well by name. So they, at least they, at least they respect us. So then they call us, they ask the opinion. I tell them very few, whatever I found. It. And by God grace so far, I always, uh, where whatever I say, I do a very minor observation. So even if I do the study in 10, 10 subjects, I always was able to do that, multiply in 100 or 1,000 or 2,000. Same way for LSDs, I started with 100 patients. Now I have 10,000 patients, but my conclusion has not changed. With again, with the high risk group, 40%, voucher is the common, MPS is not spent. Why? So that's every pattern now I think we know much better, but that my initial observation has not changed. So what I to try to, what one, everyone should do is, wherever you are, like you are in South area, to the Southern area, try to translate, make some the magazines, reach out, may not only magazines, write, make some writing in a common man language with the common people knows about it. See, I, we talk about okay, vitamin deficiency prevalent in India. What is there? Who knows about it? Make that in the impact on the people there, so people can start understanding. I in that paper I wrote that you when nowadays I tell the people here, you just have a 20, 20 minutes sun exposure in a daytime, in a morning time, your vitamin D for a day you will get it. You have a good exposure without sun exposure. So this is that this is because I know very well, like B12. I know that the, the, we have a the couple coming up with a recurrent pregnancy loss or so many other things are there, like they have abnormal chromosomal segregation problems or maybe some pregnancy loss is there or the neural tube defect is there or maybe with the Down syndrome child. We know that we do not know the exact genetic cause of that. It's a multifactor. So then I always say we take at least vitamin B12 and folate because these are the very the, uh, the primary nutrient involved with our DNA synthesis, DNA methylation process, and the chromosome segregation. So if your B12 and folate is normal, at least you are reducing a chance. I cannot say you will not have the problem, but at least you are reducing your chance to have the recurrence of the uh, situations. So this is how I, we, everybody has to translate that knowledge to the common people, but in their own language, talkative language, in their own language. Right, sir. Um... As you as you very well said, I think it's awareness that actually then ends up uh, shaping public policy and shaping opinions and making a change. Uh, so that brings me to the last question for uh, today, sir. What's the next step? What's the step forward? How can we, uh, at the uh, national level, uh, increase awareness and just get to the people out there and uh, you know spread the message, uh, get them more and more interested in genetics? What's the next step, sir? 
is very important is uh, uh, very important that we must scientists are you know, we all scientists as I equally are very shy and not outspoken. So even I do a good science from the very I may publish in the nature or land side, but then I don't speak out the public. What the common right? Recently we our center we have I think we were the second author in Lancet paper on aspirin. He said uh, take aspirin a day for the prevention of the Lynch syndrome. Dr. Hershey and it was a 20 studies in UK. And our center was a part of that. And even COVID also will be surprised that uh, we, we wrote that the, we were the first one from our center. Give aspirin to the COVID patients. I think this was way back in 2019. We wrote an email. People must have taken not seriously. But then we know that aspirin is one of the main important link for the therapeutic part for the COVID treatment. So to make awareness, at least when you do the science, Talk in the media, talk in the print media, write down the news articles, organize the seminars, not only for the doctors, not scientists, but for the common people. So make a public platform and then grow. Like, you know, it, we have to have a rule. I would say that when we do the PhD, we make a compulsory that if your thesis spending three, four years, lakhs of rupees for the PhD work, uh, at least you should be able to translate that in 10 to 15 minutes talk how your PhD is going to get the benefit to the common man. So one person has to clear that viva also. And you know, in UK, this is a rule. In, at least in Newcastle University, I know that the, every PhD student have to give openly to the, to the public auditorium and give a talk to your thesis work. Understand the complex science telling to the common man that what the, my science is going to help you people. So that is why you should give me money. That is very, very interesting. Very important. I think understand that we do that and Nesta has to do that. We have a lot of regulations. And as far as the policy is concerned, the regulatory policies in the genetics, I think awareness, we know doing very good work. He is uh, always on Twitter and he, I think he's very, uh, and likely in our center also, Dr. Hurst, he just joined from UK with us. He's very active on Twitter. I like that. So we are think little old, so we are not that active in the, with the, prayer, the media, but at least I'm more active in the print media and writing the, the article in my local language to the talking to the Doodasan people. I just call them up. If I find something like recently we published a paper, that the first global paper for Morpio. I say, why the Gujarat has got the highest number of Morpio patients? You know, one only, we have not disclosed the community. We just published in BMC Genomics. Only one community has got a founder mutation, P77R, in GLNS gene. And that is the reason, and that mutation has come before 450 years before here. We published that recently. Same way for test sex, we identified the founder mutation, some one community in Saurashtra. So if I always tell if your child is born, and suddenly you find that he has a neurodegradation and he just lose the lung skill and he just die, possibly test sex, because they have founder mutations. E462V and B322Y in the particular community in Gujarat. So these two are the important issues, which is very rare otherwise. Doctor, again, I think we were the first one to say the L triple four P is the most common mutation in India. That was the first paper I think Baba Center has published in 2014, my PhD student. And then again, 2019, as a part of the ICMR, uh, the task force, we published a paper that L triple four P is a common uh, mutation in India with 60, 65%. Is that common marker? And you can screen the molecular studies. If you don't find, then go for the sequencing. So that's one of the easiest ways, just 3,000 rupees, you can do the L triple four P screening. And if you don't find, then you go for the other for the, uh, sequence of the gene. So I think better to take talk in science. I will say try to talk to the people in their own language. Right. In their own language. Right. That's that's a very important takeaway, sir. And especially the idea that every PhD student should be able to discuss their work and you know tell share its importance. That's that's extremely yeah, 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 simply mm -hmm. don't make it don't make the science in a complicated way. Yeah. Try to simplify if you have heard the normal narrative, if you understand that they're how do you talk, they mesmerize because they talk from the heart in a very simple way. Though what whatever the complex subject is there, but try to make it simplified. Right. So let, let the common man to understand it. Right, sir. Sir, that is um, what I think, uh, 
sir sir thank you so much for this extremely interesting talk sir i learned a lot from from talking to you i'm sure everybody else will learn a lot as well uh, thank you for giving us your time and for making these really interesting observations i think we can take your example and learn uh, from your example how to how to reach out to the maximum of people and really make a difference thank you for thank you so very nice of you to bring an opportunity and uh, to talk to you at length so nice of you and god bless you keep it